So finishing this unit up, we're going to look at antimicrobial treatment. So over 100 years ago in the U.S., one out of three children died from infectious diseases before the age of five. This is due to things like scarlet fever, diphtheria, tuberculosis, meningitis, and other childhood diseases and things that we get vaccinations for now, okay, like smallpox, all right? Um, and so the introduction of modern drugs was a major, major uh, onset a really great discovery to control infections it was a major medical revolution in the 1940s we could treat infections with antibiotics uh, once we got vaccinations we could prevent many viral diseases so antimicrobial drugs have reduced the incidence of certain infections but they have not completely of course eradicated infectious disease and probably never will Today, doctors are worried that we are dangerously close to a post-antibiotic era. We have things like, well, we have medications that aren't affected because we have things like antimicrobial resistance. Uh, and so that's the challenge we're facing now. Remember that chemotherapy is not what we think of in the everyday use of the word. It's not just for somebody with cancer. Chemotherapy is any kind of treatment with chemicals, all right, technically. So the goal of antimicrobial chemotherapy is to administer a drug to an infected person that destroys the agent without harming the host cell. This is not as easy as it sounds. The ideal drug needs to be easy to administer. Uh, toxic to the pathogen, but not to our cells, okay? Um, it needs to stay active long enough for it to actually work and be effective and be easily broken down and removed by the body. So here are some more of those important considerations. We already said toxic to the microbe, but not toxic to the host cells. This is particularly an issue for things that are also eukaryotes, like fungal. This is why fungal issues are so hard to treat, because whatever we are doing to fungal or protozoa, we're doing to our own cells. And so that makes it much more difficult to treat. They need to be microbial killing instead of just microstatic, if that's possible, uh, or when possible, I should say. They need to be relatively soluble. They need So they need to function even when highly diluted by bodily fluids because our body is 70% water. They need to remain strong enough to act before it is broken down and not be broken down or excreted too soon, all right? Um, they need to not lead to the development of uh, resistance, like antibiotic resistance. They need to complement or assist activities of the host defenses, our immune system. Okay, so they need to work along in conjunction with our immune system. They need to remain active in our tissues and body fluids, like we said, long enough to be able to get rid of the microbe. But then they need to be able to be um, excreted from the body. Okay. Um, they also need to be delivered to the correct area of infection, which can be challenging. They need to be affordable, okay? We know that there are some medications, uh, you hear about it in the news all the time, about how expensive some medications are, so they must be affordable. And then they not need to be counteractive to the health of the host, all right? They don't need to cause allergies. They don't need to cause things that predispose the host to other infections, so like so often the use of steroids, for instance, can do. All right, so this is a really good list of some vo very important vocabulary terms that you need to be sure to know. I'm not going to read um, all of these to you, but do be sure that you know these. Um, we can talk about prophylaxis, and that's going to be something that you do a prophylactic is something you do to prevent an infection. A lot of time, if you go out of the country, um, they will give you something as a prophylactic to prevent you from catching something. Um, that's pretty um, something that we see a lot of. Broad spectrum, you're going to see talked about a lot. That means that it can affect a whole range of microbes, okay, as compared to narrow spectrum, which means only a few. So be sure you know all of these terms, okay? 
All right, so practice question. An RN is caring for a 26-year-old male who is being treated for meningococcal disease. His family members have been started on an antibiotic to prevent them from contracting the disease. This is an example of A, chemotherapy, B, prophylaxis, C, herd immunity, or D, host defenses. Pause this and come out with your answer. All right, so you may be wondering, is there more than one answer? Okay, because chemical treatment. Uh, is this, uh, if he's being treated for meningi meningococcal disease and the families are put on antibiotics, doesn't that qualify as chemotherapy? Yes, it does. But a lot of times you have to choose the most correct answer. Here, the most correct answer is prophylaxis. All right, so where do we get many of our antimicrobial drugs? Well, nature is actually the best producer of antimicrobial drugs. Antibiotics are actually products of fungi or bacteria. They are antagonistic, which means they inhibit um, the growth of other microorganisms and they by competing for the same space or producing producing particular chem, chemicals that are antagonistic for those particular species. Uh, some examples of these are for bacteria we're looking at streptomyces and bacillus. Those are two common bacterial um, species that produce antibiotics. Penicillium and cephalosporum, those are common fungal sources of antibiotics. And so we can actually get these medications from nature many, many times. All right, so what do we need to know before we begin treatment? Before actual antimicrobial therapy can begin, we have three factors that need to be known. One, we've got to know what we're treating, right? We have to be able to figure out what we're treating. This is where a lot of our lab activities come in. Two, we need to know what is that particular species sensitive to, all right? And then three, we need to know the overall health of the patients, which is one area that, that nurses are very, very uh, important. They have an important role to play in because this is where background information and those questions come into play, all right? So, identification of infectious agents needs to begin ASAP uh, because remember, dilution is the solution to pollution. We need to often, especially with those gram negative bacteria, we need to reduce those numbers as soon as we can, okay? Um, because remember, bacteria have that exponential or logarithmic growth. We need to cut that as soon as we can. All right. And so this should occur before antimicrobial drugs are given, usually. Um, and so we want to uh, reduce those numbers. Direct examination of bodily fluids like sputum or stool sample is a good method for detection and identification. Uh, taking a swab of something and then throwing it on the microscope, gram staining it, trying to figure out what it is. All right. Uh, doctors often begin therapy on the basis of immediate findings and informed guesses. So sometimes we have to start treatment. Um, just because it's going to take several days for something to grow, all right? So, for example, if you have a sore throat that seems to be caused by streptopogenes, looks pretty, pretty close to that, then they may go ahead and prescribe a broad-spectrum antibiotic like penicillin until testing can be done. And then if they need to change it, they will. And that is something we are all familiar with, okay? Um, also, you can use epidemiological statistics to help. All right, so some microorganisms are going to require antibiotic sensitivity testing, and some do not. What that means is we're going to test them to see what are they going to respond the best to. We have a lab for this. Um, I'm not sure where it's at. I think it's a little more towards the end that you will do towards maybe week seven. Um, anyway, so any that develop resistance, they definitely need to be treated to see what they are susceptible to. Do they have the resistance? Because remember, bacteria can pass that resistance on, but not all of them will have it. So Staphylococcus or Staph species, Staphylococcus species, um, gonorrhea species, Neisseria gonorrhea, Enterococcus, um, gram negative bacilli, all of these need to be tested to see what particular antibiotics that species that your patient has, um, what are they going to be susceptible to, okay? Because um, Anyway, so uh, protozoal infections we, and fungal infections, we don't usually need to do this for because the medications for those are usually going to affect all members of, this, of the group. 
All right, so how do we test for antibiotic susceptibility? Well, one way we do that is the Kirby-Bauer technique. And like I said, week seven, you're going to do the simulation over this lab. Um, and I'm really kind of excited about that because I've not had the best luck doing antibiotic sensitivity in the classroom. Uh, we have the risk of, of allergies and that types of things. So this is a great way to do that, all right? Kirby-Bauer is an agar diffusion test that is gonna tell us about my antimicrobial susceptibility. Uh, and so the steps for that are going to be you're going to spread bacterium on a plate of guitar, uh, not guitar, agar, and add a little antibiotic disc onto the lawn of bacteria and incubate. So first you're going to spread the bacteria. You're going to let it. Um, you're going to place a little disc around in circles, and we'll see a picture of this in a second, and then you're going to incubate it, and you're going to see how it grows, okay? And so if it is susceptible to the antibiotic, you will have a clear area, or what we call the zone of inhibition, and be sure you know this, uh, where the bacteria will not grow, all right? And so you will measure that, and the larger the area, the better the antibiotic will work, okay? And so it's really a pretty cool method. You can test seven, eight, um, maybe even nine depends on the on the disc, I guess. Um, bacteria, um, sorry, antibiotics at the same time. So this is really handy. Okay, so the zone of inhibition is a clear area where bacteria have been killed. So um, and that's going to be around each the each disc, and it reflects a lack of growth of bacteria because they can't grow where something is that's going to kill them. All right. So we're going to measure that and compare it for which one is going to work. This is very effective for anaero anaerobic or very slow growing bacteria. All right, so here's a really good picture. So after inoculating, the antibiotic containing discs are going to be dropped onto the agar. Okay, so you're going to swab this, all right, and then you're going to drop these discs around here, probably a little more evenly. Okay, um, and then like we said, you are going to um, put it into a uh, incubator. <laughs> Sorry, I'm tired this morning. My brain is not quite awake yet. You're going to put it into an incubator and let it grow. All of this stripy looking stuff, this is where the bacteria are growing. This clear area, this is where the bacteria are not growing. This is the zone of inhibition. Each of these discs has a different antibiotic on it, okay? And so you can see that over here. So let's let's compare these results, all right? And you can refer back to this when you get ready to do this lab. So this is going to be uh, oxytetracycline, okay? And I'm re having to read on my big screen because it's a little small for me there. Um, it has a very small zone of inhibition. And so you would measure that, okay? And you'll take a little ruler and you'll measure this in the lab. And remember, if you don't measure it correctly, it won't let you move forward. So if your letters are red, you need to measure again, all right? So you'll put your ruler on it and measure it, okay? So we can tell by eyeballing that is the smallest. That is the least effective antibiotic, okay? You can also tell by this one, this is probably going to be the most effective, all right? But if you have some that are this close in size, this is where your measurements are really important, okay? Plus, remember, we said patient history. So even if this is the most effective, it may not be the one you're able to give your patient. So you need to measure these and be able to rank them, look at your patient's conditions, and see what is going to work best for that particular patient, okay? If they have allergies or other contraindicating conditions, you need to know, all right? So this one here we have is uh, enrofloxin. Uh, then we have gentamicin here, ampicillin, um, and we have two others here, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. So that's kind of basically how this is going to work. It's pretty handy. Um, this one down here at the bottom is another type of diffusion test. It's a little bit different. This is called an e-test. You won't do this one in the lab. This uses a strip to produce the zone of inhibition. Um, the advantage of the e-test is that the strip contains a gradient of a drug calibrated in micrograms. So this way, um, you can measure by observing the mark on the strip that corresponds to the edge of the zone of inhibition. A little less common, but it is an alternative. So here's a sample chart of some different um, results that you would get here. You can see some different drug names here, zone size for susceptibility, zone size for resistance, and example results and some evaluations here. 
So this is a tube dilution test. This is more sensitive and more quantitative. Quantitative means quantity. Qualitative means quality. So quantitative is going to always be numbers. All right. Um, so this is a little more quantitative than the Kirby Bauer. So a little more precise is what that means. Uh, the antimicrobial is diluted in um, serial dilution and serially in tubes of a broth. Each tube is going to be inoculated with a small uniform sample of a pure culture incubated and then examined. You're going to have a minimum inhibitory concentration and that is the smallest concentration which is the highest dilution of the drug that visibly inhibits growth. So this is very useful in determining the smallest effective dosage and providing a comparative index against other antimicrobials. Okay. So here at the top in A, the antibiotic is diluted serially through tubes of liquid nutrients from right to left. Okay, All tubes are inoculated with an identical amount of bacterium and then incubated. First tube on the left is a control, so that does not have the drug, and that shows maximum growth. So you can compare to that. The first tube in the series that shows no growth. Uh, is going or no turbidity is going to contain the concentration of antibiotic that is the MIC, okay, the minimum inhibitory concentration. Uh, down here in B, the microbial dilution, this is done in a multi well plate. So this is basically a plastic plate um, that has these little bitty tiny wells in it that you drop them in, okay, instead of test tubes. So here we've got amphotoserin B, uh, a couple other antibiotics that are tested on a pathogenic yeast, okay? Um, and so pink indicates growth, uh, not antibiotics, but anyway, pink indicates growth and blue indicates no growth. So the numbers indicate the dilution of the MIC, again, and the X on, in each row shows the first well without growth. So once started, it is very important to observe the patient's response to a medication. In vitro activity of a drug is not always correlated with the in vivo. Of what that means is um, in vitro means it's outside of the organism, grown outside of the organism. In vivo means it's inside a living organism. OK, so sometimes it's different when it's grown outside of an organism versus when we actually try to put it in the target organism. OK, so failure of antimicrobial treatment is often due to things like one inability of the drug to diffuse into that particular body compartment, uh, especially areas like joints where we don't have good blood flow. This skin or the brain where we have to deal with that blood brain barrier okay resistant microbes in the infection also may not make it into the sample that you used for testing so if there is um, resistance that you don't know about you may encounter that an infection also can be caused by more than one pathogen especially when we are talking to biofilm about biofilms not to biofilms um, anyway so um, sorry that just I totally lost my of thought and I should probably stop recording but you know hey might as well be up for your amusement right okay so especially if it is mixed you may have a biofilm for instance and one thing in there may be resistant to the drug while others are not okay or mm, this is probably the most common the patient doesn't take the antimicrobials correctly something I actually have been uh, guilty of myself not following directions so it is really important that we are able to explain to patients why the length of time matters, okay? All right, so what is the therapeutic index? Be sure you know this one. Um, a ratio, of course, be sure you know everything, but sometimes uh, if I remember for sure they're on the test, I try to point it out to you. Um, the ratio of the dose of a drug that is toxic to humans versus the minimum effective dose for the pathogen. This is assessed to predict the potential for toxic drug reactions. This is the therapeutic index. Uh, so the smaller the ratio, the greater the, <laughs> the greater the potential for toxic drug reactions. So you can look there, uh, the one up top, 1.1, that has a higher therapeutic index, so that is a risky choice. Um, the one where you below that over here has a therapeutic index, I'm sorry, I said that backwards, of 10 has a, is a safer choice. So the smaller the ratio. Uh, so 1.1 is a smaller number. Um, and so it's more risky. A 10 is a safer number. OK, um, so the drug with the highest therapeutic index is the safest one. All right. Sorry, I said that backwards. 
So before prescribing an antibiotic, that patient history is very important. I'm sorry, I'm just really tongue-tied today, but I'm not recording these 10 times over. All right, plus, like I said, you can just laugh at me. All right, so um, we need to know those pre-existing conditions, all right? Uh, is there a histi history of allergies? Is there underlying kidney disease? Um, are they pregnant? Are they older? Are they very, very young? Uh, are they taking other medications, okay? Also, probiotics are often recommended to prevent diarrhea if you are taking antibiotics. And so somebody that is susceptible to that, like say somebody with irritable, irritable bowel, uh, may need to be a little more careful um, and take probiotics for sure. Although it never hurts anybody to have a little extra yogurt when you are on antibiotics, right? Um, some drugs also have synergistic effects, meaning that they may work together in synergy, and so they may need a reduced dose. Elderly patients often metabolize things differently, so that can affect the dosage that they take. Lots of things to consider. All right, so let's try and apply this information. Uh, we have an elderly alcoholic patient with pneumonia, um, and it's, the pneumonia is caused by clavicella and is complicated by the fact that because of his alcoholism, he's got dim diminished liver and kidney function. And so he requires drug administration, parenteral drug administration, and he has a history of allergy to penicillins, okay? So the elderly alcoholic patient with pneumonia, um, all drugs must be given by injection for him because of prior damage to the gastrointestinal tract by alcohol use. Um, this is going to cause limited absorption, and so you're going to have to give medications by injection. Very important, or you're not doing any good. Testing shows that the infectious agent is sensitive to cephalosporins, gentamicin, uh, imipenem and uh, azlocillin, all right? So the previous penicillin um, allergy history rules these out, the penicillin drugs out, okay? Drug interactions can occur between the cephalosporins and alcohol, and if they're an alcoholic, you can't just tell them not to drink because that's most likely not going to happen. Gentamicin can be toxic to the kidneys. Um, so... Imipenem causes GI discomfort, but it is less toxic, and so it is therefore the best choice. So sometimes it's not always the perfect match, but it's what is going to be the best choice. All right. So next we have a cancer patient that has a severe systemic candida infection, which is a yeast infection. Okay, it can be systemic. Um, we've got uh, IV uh, amphocytarin B or fluconazole, or those are the only two possibilities, all right? Even when all of the information is in, the final choice of a drug is not always easy or straightforward to choose, okay? Sometimes it is the lesser of two evils, so to speak, or what is just going to work the best with what we have, the challenges we have to overcome. So how do these uh, medications work? Well, the goal of antimicrobial drugs is to either disrupt cell processes or structures for fungi, bacteria, or protozoa, or inhibit, inhibit replication of viruses. So many enzymes interfere, many drugs interfere with enzyme function um, with their ability to make macromolecules um, or, or make structures that are needed in the cell, but above all, drugs are selectively toxic by killing or inhibiting the microbial cells, preferably without harming ours, right? We don't want to kill our own cells, okay? Drugs with excellent selective toxicity can actually block the ability to make bacterial cell walls. These are going to be things like penicillins, all right? Human cells lack the same chemicals in peptidoglycan, and so they are unaffected by the cells. We are in a different domain, and so what we are doing to their cell wall isn't necessarily going to harm ours. But like I have said, that is much more challenging for things like fungi or protozoa because those are also eukaryotes, so they are much more similar. Drugs that are most toxic to humans um, 
drugs that act on a structure that is common to both the are going to be those that are common to both the infective agent and the host cell like a cytoplasmic membrane okay so for instance when we have something that is also a eukaryote so as the characteristics of the infectious agents are more similar to the host cell uh, the more that selective toxicity becomes more difficult to achieve in other words the more it is like our cells, the harder it is to find a treatment that is not going to cause problems for us. This is also why it is so important to be able to educate your patients. You may have a stubborn patient like myself <laughs> that doesn't like to come for a follow-up. Uh, and if they are, are getting treatment for something like a fungi or a protozoa, and the medication is potentially, potentially harmful to their liver because it is the same domain is us they need to understand why that is so important for them to come back in and do that follow-up appointment and check and make sure that everything is okay and they need to understand that that is a possible outcome just because of the nature of the microbe there's nothing we can do about that all right but a lot of times you've got to be able to get them to understand why it is so important to come in okay Here's a little more detail on the mode or mechanism of action for drugs, okay? The goals of chemotherapy. So here we want to disrupt the structure or function of an organism to the point where it can no longer survive, all right? The first step towards this is to identify the structural and metabolic needs of the living cell. This is why we had to learn the differences between eukaryotic cells, prokaryotic cells, and all those little things you're probably wondering, why do I care what kind of membrane or why do I care if it has peptidoglycan? That's because we got to know how it's built if we're going to tear it apart, <laughs> okay? So we want to see how the cell works, all right? Once we know this, we can figure out how to remove, disrupt, or interfere with their vital cell processes. Antimicrobial drugs are categorized based on the metabolic targets that they affect and include these five targets, some of which we have mentioned, okay? Inhibition of the cell wall, inhibition of nucleic acid structure and function, inhibition of protein synthesis, interfering with that cytoplasmic membrane with the structure or function of or both, and inhibiting folic acid synthesis. All right, so here's an example, protein synthesis inhibitors. Um, the site of action here is going to be the 50S subunit of the ribosomal subunit. Uh, things like erythromycin, clindamycin um, are gonna affect that. Uh, site of action for 30S, the small subunit. Uh, this is gonna be things like gentamicin and streptomycin that are gonna target those areas, tetracyclines. Um, side of action being both the 30 and 50 S subunits, because if you can, if you affect that ribosomal subunit, you can't do translation, right? You can't do protein synthesis, okay? Um, and so if we destroy the machine, we can't make stuff with it. Um, and so that's going to block the initiation of protein synthesis, all right? Folic acid synthesis in the cytoplasm. Um, we want to block pathways and inhibit um, metabolism. Sulfanamides or sulfa drugs do that. Cell wall inhibitors will block synthesis and repair of the cell wall. Uh, things that do that are your penicillin, cephalosporins, vancomycin, bacitracin. All right, so we have lots in that category. Um, disruption of the cell membrane, which means you can cause a loss of selective permeability. Uh, permeability. This is going to be your polymyxins, deftomycin. All right, uh, inhibiting DNA or RNA. Uh, synthesis, all right? So you can inhibit replication or transcription. Um, you can inhibit gyrase, which is one of the unwinding enzymes. These are going to be your quinones, all right? Like chlorohydroxyquinone. Um, you can also inhibit RNA polymerase, and that's going to be like uh, rifampin, all right? And so you can, you can read all of these and get all of these names. Those are just the general ones. All right, time for NCLEX practice question. A patient is admitted to the hospital with pneumonia. A chest x-ray is obtained and a specimen is sent to the lab for culture and sensitivity testing. So we're going to grow it out and see what antibiotics it's sensitive to. 
The provider orders an antibiotic therapy to begin. So what should the RN say uh, when providing patient education about antibiotic therapy? Should it be A, we will be giving you antibiotics because respiratory viruses are common in the community right now and we suspect you have viral pneumonia. B, we are starting a broad spectrum um, antibiotic and a narrow spectrum antibiotic so we can be sure to treat all organisms that can be causing your infection. C, your chest x-ray appears to show bacterial pneumonia. As results from the lab specimen return, your antibiotic therapy may be changed. Or D, it is important to notify me immediately if you develop nausea or diarrhea as it indicates the antibiotic is not working. So pause and come up with your answer. All right, so if you chose A, what's wrong with A? Well, A says viral pneumonia. Do we give antibiotics for viruses? Um, B says broad spectrum and narrow spectrum. We don't usually give two different antibiotics like that. C is the correct answer, okay? D isn't completely wrong. Well, it is wrong because it says the antibiotic's not working. It doesn't mean the antibiotic's not working. It means the antibiotic is doing its job. It's just killing off normal microbiota and we need to offset that, okay? So yes, the answer is C. All right, this video is getting a little long, but the next few slides I'm not going to talk a whole lot about, so I'm just going to go ahead and leave it, all right? Do know the class of medications and some of the examples here, uh, like ampicillin, cefloxin, bacitration, or van vancomycin, penicillins that treat gram-positive cocci, some gram-negative, uh, amoxicillin being broad spectrum. So do, do be familiar with some of these more um, common names here all right in their classes these are drugs that target the cell wall this is on the study guide so be sure to do that so you need to know which penicillins that penicillins do target the cell wall be familiar with the more common ones like i said like ampicillin so these are drugs that target protein synthesis same as before i want you to be familiar with the general class and then a few of the common ones like tetracycline streptomycin clindamycin erythromycin azithromycin those all inhibit protein synthesis you need to know that streptomycin is, is broad spectrum tetracycline works against gram positive gram negative aerobic and anaerobic species uh azithromycin that is your common z pack okay that's pretty broad spectrum good for ear respiratory and skin um, and even mycobacterium is important for AIDS patients okay so, so be sure and review all of these but be familiar with which classes you need to know aminoglycosides tetracyclines target protein synthesis and then some of the common names all right drugs that target folic acid synthesis we've got sulfa drugs all right, sulfanamides, those are very common to treat UTIs, some protozoa, silver sulfadiazine, uh, that's good for burns or eye infections. So polymyxins target cytoplasmic or cell membranes. These are good for drug resistant species as pseudomonas or very severe UTIs caused by gram negative rods. Uh, Deptomycin is the most effective against gram positive bacteria. Again, know the definition here of broad spectrum. That's going to be like tetracyclines versus narrow spectrum, which is going to be more like polymyxin. This is a really good uh, slide to study here. Um, I would be familiar with this one. Um, we may not get to all of this, this particular unit or test, but it is really good to know like you're going to need to know what we give to a lot of tick-borne diseases are going to be tetracyclines. That's going to come up over and over again. So I would go ahead and start trying to learn this particular slide here. So biofilms are a particular nasty problem to deal with. Remember, they are a consortium of microorganisms that stick to each other and also to a surface. Bacteria and biofilms are just not going to behave the same as when they are free living. So they often can be unaffected by antimicrobials. You cannot penetrate to the um, underneath the bacteria line underneath. You cannot penetrate the sticky material surrounding them. They often have a very different phenotype and different antibiotic susceptibility profile than actually free living bacteria. So these guys are really hard to deal with. 
So um, how do we treat biofilms? Well, quarantine sensing pathways, these, uh, well, let's go ahead and back up for a minute. We want to interrupt the quorum sensing pathways. What does that mean? Remember, that is how they communicate between cells. Daptomycin is shown to be very effective in deep tissue infections with resist resistance bacteria. We've also found that uh, DNA ACE, um, adding DNA ACE to antibiotics can help it to penetrate through and reach bacteria and any device that is going to be implanted we have found that if you treat it first it's going to be much less likely to develop so we've already kind of discussed this but it never hurts to re reiterate that if you have a fungal cell or a protozoa these are particularly difficult to treat they have special problems in chemotherapy drugs that are designed to act on these are in effect uh, on bacteria are not going to work against fungi Okay, we have fewer antifungal, anti helminth, and anti protozoa drugs because they are just too similar to eukaryotes. So they can be toxic to us. All right, and so this poses a particularly uh, difficult problem. This is a good little chart here. Uh, you don't need to know every detail, but you need to know what agents are used to treat fungal infections. Info to sarin B, for instance, is good for uh, Candida alb albicans, histoplasmosis, and uh, Cryptococcus meningitis. Meningitis, azoles like myconazole uh, are good for, of course, yeast, which is candidiasis, or uh, fluconazole for mycosis. We have a very large diversity among protozoa and helminthes. We will only discuss a few treatments here. Quinine is actually from a tree and has been used for hundreds of years, but has been replaced by things like horoquinine and primaquinine, which are going to be less toxic. Uh, for protozoal infections, we're going to have things like metrodionazole, which is going to be basically flagell. All right, um, that's going to be more GI intestinal type infections, Giardia, Trichomonas, uh, into amoeba. Um, we also have some sulfanamides and tetracyclines that are also really good for antiprotozoal um, medications. All right, so why is it hard to, or what are the particular challenges for uh, medications that treat helminths or worms, all right? Well, these are very much larger than most of our other microorganisms. Their physiology, again, is too much like ours. Uh, if we block reproduction, it doesn't often affect the adult worms, and it is very hard to immobilize, disintegrate, or inhibit metabolism because they have a very complex life cycle. They have different stages, and what happens to one stage doesn't always prevent it from occurring in another stage, so very challenging. All right, so here are some of the different medications that we use. Uh, Praziquantel is a very common one um, for tapeworm flukes. Ivermectin, uh, you have heard a lot of people using ivermectin that you need to only do that under a doctor's supervision. That's usually a, a veterinary drug used for um, animals, but it can be used in humans, but it needs to be done under the doctor's care, okay? Um, Infectious agents rely on the host cell for the vast majority of their metabolic functions. And so the current drugs here are going to act by disrupting their vital metabolism requirements, disrupting the cell metabolism of the host. Okay. All right. So the current antiviral medications were developed to target specific points in the infection cycle of the virus. Um, Okay, for some reason I thought I was on the right side talking about viruses. So three modes of action for anti uh, antivirals. Stop penetrating of the virus into the host cell. Block their transcription or translation, which means they cannot copy their RNA or DNA, and prevent them from maturing into uh, fully mature virus particles. So that's how those work. Some different particular ones that we have. Uh, we've got one that blocks HIV infection. We can block influenza, the entry into the cell. Things like Ciclovir, which is used to treat herpes simplex virus. Um, Ribavirin, which is used for RSV, which is the respiratory syncytial virus. Tamiflu, which blocks influenza from leaving the host cell. Um, our antiviral drugs are just not that great, but at least we do have some now and they will get better with current re research undergoing.